I, I was very interested in the, I mean, seems like the central theme uh, to a large extent, uh, the idea that every good for Aristotle is good insofar as it has contemplative value. Um, and that this is true even for ethical goods. And so what's interesting about that, I mean, it does sort of go back to what you were talking about with re relationality, right? Um, because it, it means that any time that we're talking about things and their intrinsic value, we are still talking about their value in relation to um, any being that is able to rationally contemplate them. And of course, that is absolutized because of his theology, um, which is less important, less not less important, but less explicitly discussed in your book. But obviously, the fact that there is a God, there is a stable, um, uh, always existing being who whose sole activity is contemplation. Um, you know, makes this not a relativistic statement to where, you know, goodness is in the eye of the beholder or something like that. Right. Goodness is in, for Aristotle, goodness is in the eye of the one who is really thinking clearly right. about things, um, where that is the person who has put an awful lot of effort into um, the effort to, uh, the, the, the project of living virtuously and thinking, thinking truly. Uh, and you're right, that is anchored by the fact that his God is this pure intellect, so that the first principle of all reality is um, this, this intellect, uh, that, uh, uh, so that, that placing the good in relationship to thought is not a relativization because thought is the first principle of reality. Mm -hmm. We talked about this idea that the, the good is good for Aristotle insofar as it can be thought, but mm -hmm. um, there's obviously a um, a lot of different arguments that get you to that place uh, in the book. And um, I'm actually not sure where to, what, what to focus on because there's so many different topics uh, that you draw from. Um, but uh, how would you, you know, for, for a lay audience such as my listeners, how would you, uh, what, what's one of the arguments that you would uh, give from Aristotle for that? So we're, we want an argument for the correlativity of goodness and thought. Yes. Right? That's, that's what we're looking, looking for. So I think that Aristotle does not in any one place, um, set this out as a thesis and defend it in its general form. What he does is he lives it and he, he invites his students into the living of it, right? So it, it's maybe best to take um, an example, begin with an example from the moral life, right? Um, imagine we are faced with the question, should I have that second slice of chocolate cake? Right? Should I have that second slice of chocolate cake? And you either decide to have the second slice of chocolate cake or you decide not to have it. Let's say you decide to have it, right? Now, now we imagine two different people. One person decides to have, ha, have it because they're vaguely aware that they should cut down on sweets, but, uh, and, and, and sometimes they manage it, but right now they're feeling a little bit down and they want that little boost, and so they have the, the slice of chocolate cake, um, and it's all sort of done in, a, in, a, in a, an emotional, relatively thoughtless moment, right? The other person has that... Um, that second slice of chocolate cake, um, because although uh, he too is supposed to be cutting down on sweets, um, he has just hit um, a significant milestone, uh, personal milestone in terms of weight loss, um, and it happens also to be um, the Feast of the Immaculate Conception, mm -hmm. or something like that, 
Mm -hmm. Right. And it's it's very deliberate, not something that was agonized about forever, but it was a sense that this is the appropriate action right now. Mm -hmm. right? So Aristotle asks us to consider these two actions and think of the first one as a more or less random outcome of conflicting emotions on the part of a person who does not really live with a great consistency of thoughtfulness. And the second action as the action of person uh, of the person who has a really good understanding of the raw materials of which his life is made food health the pleasure of food the celebration of the saints um the uh, the achievement of somewhat arbitrary but still really important milestones uh in in uh, in terms of setting goals for oneself and so that second action both of them eat the cake but the second action is that finely crafted work of art that takes the raw materials of a human life and works them up into something that's really beautiful, right? Why is it beautiful? It's beautiful because it thoughtfully takes account of all the different aspects of the situation and makes them a situation into a situation, the situation into a situation in which a human being is really thriving, right? Um, and so, the the second person takes delight in being able to make that decision, maybe not in a self-centered way, but it's really satisfying to be able to make that right, that, that correct decision. What is the nature of the satisfaction? It's not just that the chocolate cake tastes good. It's that the action that I am engaging in is thoughtful in a way that's really satisfying to a being that lives by thinking. Mm -hmm. right? um, so then we could take as our second example, um, I don't know, dissecting an earthworm. You might find, you might think that earthworms are really gross and that the uh, prospect of, of picking one up to save it from, uh, from drying out on your driveway after uh, after a rain is distasteful, and you really don't want to cut one up in your in your tenth grade biology classroom or or whenever it is, um, and Aristotle is aware of this this distaste, but he's also aware that if you do cut up that earthworm, you're going to find that it has a digestive tract that is similar in many ways to ours, right? Um, and he asks his students to cut up that earthworm with him, and to consider how that organization of the digestive tract might be helpful uh, to the earthworm's particular way of living. It actually turns out, Aristotle didn't know this, but it actually turns out that earthworms, by eating dirt and pooping it out after it's been transformed in various ways, systematically make the dirt in which they live a much better place for them to live in. They are creating their own environment by the way in which they eat and poop, right? Um, and so he says, Although some animals have no pleasure to charm the senses, right, they confer, they, 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 they give enormous pleasure in their contemplation to those who are capable of understanding their causes, why they are the way they are, why they act the way they act, why they have the organs that they have. Right. And so it's not so much an argument as an invitation to enter more deeply into our humanity because our humanity, when we are really living it, is self-supporting in some sense. And especially it becomes self-supporting when we realize that where our humanity has been leaving, leading us is to the contemplation of the divine, right? So it's not that, um, you know, either you know it or you don't, and I can't convince you if you, if you don't already see it. But it's also something that you can't prove because you can't prove to somebody the richness of their own humanity. What you can do is invite them, exhort them, encourage them to enter into it in ways that are accessible to them at their particular moment in the journey and hope that that bears fruit for the next stage of the journey. And so that's what Aristotle is doing with his students across his works.